In the TUC statement to Heath, we said wages are not the cause of Britain's economic troubles. Are we moving from that position? If we accept by implication that wages are the cause of inflation and voluntary restraint fails to solve the crisis as indeed it's failed to solve crises in the past, then the National Institute of Economic and Social Research report last week may be right when it stated statutory controls must follow. The document before Congress accepts there's likely to be very little growth for at least a couple of years. This is contrary to the TUC demand placed on Heath in 1972. Do you remember those demands? They were stated in the document issued by the TUC and the Labour Party. Or indeed in the TUC Labour Liaison Committee resolution of February 1973 on which our resolution is based. In the demand of the Tories for at least 6% growth, that's what was said then. In the Liaison Committee document, we demanded faster growth of national output. Wage restraint, the kernel of the social contract, is a continuation of policies which have failed and which defeated us in 1970. You see, then, to the employers, the social contract is mainly about wage restraint. It is a retreat for the, for, by the unions from the objective of redistributing wealth. On the contrary, it accepts at best the same share of the cake. It may well be that when productivity rises, as indeed it must, profits will rise and our share will actually fall. No wonder we hear of more and more employers refusing increases and quoting to our members their obligations under the social contract. And brothers and sisters, it's no good going to our members and saying, well, that isn't what we intended. Our members will blame us. We find it impossible to vote for a policy which accepts implicitly a lowering standard of living for our members. It doesn't only create disillusion and confusion. They will ask who we are supposed to represent. Neither should we vote for policies which we believe only apply to other people and not for us because we're a special case. That happened before, brothers and sisters, particularly after 1966, and what, it, what did it do for Labour other than smear trade unionists as hypocrites? The direct result was the defeat of Labour in 1970. This Congress in the past has understood quite clearly the cause of the major weaknesses in British industry. Those ailments are poor productivity and a standard of living among the lowest in Europe. This has been achieved by the refusal of the wealthy to invest in British industry. They, the comfortable and rich supporters of, of wage restraint, have spent massively outside Britain and in quick return sectors like property when they do deign to invest inside our country. Low wages will, as they always have done, encourage a continuing low investment policy. That is an economic fact of life. Our country's decline wasn't caused by our members, by members of the trade union movement, neither was it caused by high wages. And our members won't see why the plans of expansion that was passed by this Congress, pressed by this Congress on the Tories in 1972 and 1973, shouldn't be pursued by Labour with the consequent rising of standards for our people. We know where the employers stand on this issue. Their selfish anti-British prejudices have never had any limit. The latest example of their blind partiality is expressed by the Engineering Employers Federation in their recent economic review when they talk of a possible drying up of investment where if the Labour government doesn't abandon its plans for nationalisation and industrial democracy. How responsible is that? We've been told from various sources that trade unionists must behave responsibly. I believe that's an insult to our members. It's part of the same myth which suggests that our members strike at the drop of a hat. It's a measure of how responsible trade unions have been that any comparison of our members' wages and conditions with other industrialised countries nowadays shows our members to be worse off. We've been much too responsible, and I'm sure that Lawrence Daly would join me in that in saying that the miners are a classic example of past responsibility to phony policies, and they've corrected it over recent times in a way that we all understand. I believe, I believe that the trade unions have failed in a patriotic duty to force up wages so that investment had to take place. Low wages means low investment and low productivity. Congress, we've got to look at reality. We don't help a Labour government by not getting a rise at Ford's or GEC. 
The millions saved by those companies are not handed to Harrow to boost old age pensions, neither is there a guarantee that the dividends will boost our national output by the purchase of any new plant. They could just as easily be invested in Fords of Germany or GEC South Africa. A final point. A book published last week by the famous Professor Phelps Brown, reviewed in the quality press at length, states that in the last two decades, real wages have risen only in line with increased productivity and therefore could have in no way contributed to inflation.